Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 19th. First up, I would like to talk about astronomy a little bit, and particularly the star Polaris. Uh, if any of you follow astronomy news particularly close, an astronomer called David Turner had taken a spectroscopic analysis of the star Polaris, and for some reason he got a distance that was way different than before they had gotten the Hipparchos, Hipparchos project. They had gotten um, a distance of 434 light years away for Polaris, and for some reason with his spectroscopic analysis, he got a distance that was 111 light years closer. And this is really important in the world of astronomy because Polaris happens to be one of the closest stars called a Cepheid variable. And if you know anything about astronomy, Cepheid variables are used to track distances of stars over long distances in the universe, particularly other galaxies and stuff like that, and they're known to be pretty consistent in the way they pulse, so that if you know the apparent brightness of the star, you could calculate what the absolute brightness of the star would be, because of the way that if you assume it pulses exactly the same way as another Cepheid variable at a known distance, you pretty much know by the drop-off in brightness, you can calculate pretty accurate how far away that galaxy is and the star is. And, uh, in case you didn't know, Polaris is not only the North Star because it's in the North position, but it's actually moving closer to perfect North, I guess, up to the year 2100. It's going to be getting closer and closer to a perfect North position before it starts drifting away again. So it's getting better and better, and it's also a triple star. It's a gigantic star that's way larger than our Sun, but it has two companion stars one close and one a little bit farther away that are about 1.2 and 1.3 times the mass and the size of our star. So that's kind of an interesting fact and it also has two additional um, companion, they, I think they call them companion stars, not companion, uh, well the, anyway there's two other stars that are fairly close by in the system but probably not gravitationally uh, bound to the star, They're just they just happen to be nearby so there's actually a total of five stars in that region. Uh, including Polaris and its two, two companion stars that rotate around it. So it's a triple star system. And uh, as far as the uh, conclusion about that, they've uh, one of the members of the Hipparchos team has come back to contradict the uh, spectroscopic analysis. And I guess so far all the rest of the scientists are lining up on the side of the original parallax measurements being the most accurate. And the other factor being, too, that um, not only do they have some problems with the spectroscopic analysis and the way uh, Turner came across them. They also say that because of the factor of error of their measurements would be somewhere around, I think originally the original measurements were around 1%. It would have to be off by a factor of 27. When you calculate something, you always know that there's going to be a margin of error. For example, if they say it's 434 light years away, it might not be exactly that many light years away. It could be plus or minus about four light years if you've got a 1% margin of error in either direction. So they said according to this that um, if their measurements are wrong, their margin of error would have been 27 times larger than what it was calculated to be under the worst of conditions. And so looks like for now the astronomy books are not going to change and it would also change the way we figured out distances too if for some reason they were off by that big of a factor then Cepheid variables would not be quite as good of an accurate measurement for how far stars and even galaxies are from us. But anyway, next up I have a friend of mine, Navy Thomas, doing a review of an armor type. Um, I've been actually looking into D3O armor which is one of those inertial uh, variable inertial polymers, I call them. Um, they call them Newtonian fluids, but what it basically is is it's a type of plastic polymer that can um, take a, a slow hit and uh, deform a little bit, but if it takes a fast hit, there's hardly any deformation at all. So in other words, if it's hit really hard, it barely deforms. If you kind of poke at it really slow, then it does deform. So that's the new type of armor they're coming up with. So. Um, I had Navy Thomas actually get a hold of one of those. It's not the D3O, but it's one of the competitors with the, the similar type of polymer, and he's going to give a review on that. All right, this is going to be a quick review for the TDD report on the SAS Tech Armor. Capital S, small a, capital S, dash, capital T, E, C. SAS Tech Armor. This is the latest and greatest stuff that is competing with the D30. Temperature in the garage right now is about 50 degrees. 
and if you'll notice I can push in with my thumb and it leaves a dent okay at 50 degrees see other thing I wanted to show at 50 degrees you can see it slowly starting to conform and it's bending All right, now we're going to heat this bad baby up to summertime temperatures. All right, now this is not going to be an exact science deal here. I'm not going to take a temperature of it. But we got the heater on. So now I'm going to heat this up to where I feel a summertime temperature would be. All right, this feels about 80 degrees. Summertime temp. Push in on it, springs right back. Bends like a wild man. I'll do it from the same side. And now we're going to go to the hammer test. All right, now I've got it still about 80 degrees. And I'm going to hit it with a hammer. Got some dirt spots, but it rose right back up. Thing is, when this stuff uh, impacts with a hard impact, it goes rigid. Now you push in soft with your finger, it dents it, but it comes right back. But hit it with a hammer, it doesn't. It stops it immediately. Now we're going to go to the freezer test. We're going to put that bad baby in the freezer to simulate NT8 on the bike. You know, we're going to leave it in there for about two or three minutes. All right, now this is like, uh, I don't know. 10, 10 degrees, look at this, it ain't moving yo, it ain't even moving from this end, you barely push in on it, tough as nails, like the NT8. So there you go. That's my uh, Sastec body armor, back protector. I've got it in my hips, I've got it in my knees, I've got it in my shoulders, and I've got it in my elbows. And uh, this is the back protector. So winter time, what I do, I've got it set up just like this with this piece of foam. It goes between me and that plate armor. So, that's the SAS Tech armor. And uh, back to you, Chuck. Thanks, NT8. And by the way, he wanted me to mention, too, that the armor is only guaranteed to give its optimal protection down to a temperature of 5 degrees centigrade. So as it does get colder and colder, you don't get quite the effects of it being able to deform as readily. It stiffens up uh, a little bit more than it would under normal conditions. So if you ride in extreme cold weather, just be aware, like Navy Thomas has added that extra foam piece, that um, this is first-generation product. So like a lot of first-generation products, um, it's going to get better. And I'm sure as they you know, learn different formulations and different ways to produce it, it's going to end up being probably for almost any type of riding condition, especially because of the fact a lot of people are into dual sport bikes and riding very cold weather. But next up, you guys are probably waiting from last week for the what is that tool. And I will have to tell you, my guess originally was something to do with fishing. I could not have been any farther off, so just take a look at this and you'll find out what the tool is.
Okay, this is Wachuca Guy, and this is the tool that everyone was trying to figure out and scratching their heads over. And uh, there were some interesting answers. So anyway, this is a tool that, well, if you were a locksmith, you would probably recognize it right away. So anyway, if you're in a house and you have this type of a door handle here, or in my case, where I work at a hotel, and we do have on the outside of the door a little mechanism where you put your card key in, but if that fails and you need to get in that room, other than taking an axe and chopping your way in, and it's lock from the outside you have to have a way to get in well that's what this tool is for and so I'm going to try and demonstrate that for you and I'm going to use this uh, half door here so you can get a better idea of what's going on but it's the same type of handle and uh, I'm going to try and demonstrate this tool for you okay so you slip the rod under the door Bring it up. And the idea is to get it around the handle like that, pulling back on the cable, and as you see, it pulls down the handle and the door will open from the inside. Okay, thanks a lot guys. I uh, don't think anybody even got a close guess on that and it would have been really hard to even guess what that tool possibly could have been. So anyway, that was it for that's it for this week. Take care everybody. I will catch you next week.